Okay, guys, thanks. Thanks for coming on behalf of Canada. Thanks for coming to the We just wanted to kind of re-emphasize and kind of offer uh, a training program or at least some didactic for our EMS colleagues. Um, there is a signing sheet that's going to go around. We are approved for two CEUs for MIN, uh, but if you could just add, make sure that you put your MIN number and write legacy, right? So if your nickname, for example, is, you know, uh, uh, Rob, right, but your MIN number is registered under a more formal name, Please put your formal name right so I can find you uh, in the MIMS system. Uh, we also are recording these talks. Um, we're still figuring out how best to distribute it. Ultimately, we'll end up on FRA website. But for now, I've got them on my Dropbox account. Um, every week, I send out a reminder to anyone who signs up for the classes. I'll send out a link to where the, uh, this talk is, as well as a half dozen ballpark other uh, oh, talks that we have uh, recorded in the past. And I think we're scheduled now through April of 2018 with a variety of features. So please sign up, get on the email list, share this with your companies, share this with your friends, um, both the links uh, for talks. Use these links in your own companies for training, right? So if you can't do a Monday night, you, know, you could use this link, for example, and you could do a training in your own station or another day. So with how many people you have. So anyway, thanks so much, and we super appreciate all that you do. Uh, I love this quote from Margaret Mead, who was a, a cultural uh, anthropologist, who said that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has, and I truly believe that you guys are back for your community. So thanks uh, again for coming. So tonight is Dr. Or, or Lieutenant Dave Snyder. Dave Snyder is uh, EMS 5 in our area. Dave is also uh, a remarkable author and a presenter program builder. He created a program called Geriatric Care for EMS providers. That's now a published book that I'm going to show that to you. It's also a nationally taught program around the world. So super thankful for you spending your time and your expertise uh, and sharing with us. Dave, thanks. Sure. I'm going to pass these out and just please circulate them around. I didn't make any lecture notes, uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, so I'm going to send around a sign-in sheet. If you want the geriatric lecture notes afterwards, I'll send it around toward the end. If you want it, um, put your name and email address and I'm happy to email it to you. So we'll get started. So again, most people know me. I'm Dave Snyder. I'm EMS 5 on D-Shift. I've been around in the county for 31 years. So, and I'm always ha I want to thank Dr. Baron Holtz and Joe Klausik for inviting me to come talk about geriatrics. Anywhere I'm asked to go to talk about geriatric care, I'm always happy to do so. Here comes some more geriatrics in. <laughs> and we listen, we wish Tippy a happy birthday. It's his 70th birthday and he's here to spend time. So... Anyway, I'm always happy to talk about um, old, older people, but I will tell you, um, GEMS, as Dr. Barinholt said, uh, we developed in 2003. It was basically a needs-based program because so many of the people that we transport are over the age of 65, and until GEMS was published, we had very, very little training in geriatrics. And... I always compare that to the pediatric training, and you have to give the pediatric folks a lot of credit. Um, we have a tremendous amount of pediatric <coughs> training because pediatric patients uh, are, do have special needs, um, and we have a tremendous amount of training, but they only comprise nationally 10% of the patient flow. Here in Maryland, it's even less than 7% of our patient flow is pediatrics. 
but geriatrics can be anywhere from 60% of our patient flow, and we had very little training. And again, it was really a needs-based program um, because we have so many older people in this county, and we see a lot of the same older people all the time for the same problems, but we really don't know how to deal with them well. And I was of the belief that simply picking them up and transporting them to the emergency department sometimes week after week is not the answer. So we developed the GEMS, and I'm happy to say it was adopted in 2014 by the National Association of EMTs, and it's now taught um, around the world. So that was really my goal, was to, to spread the word that uh, we need to focus attention on geriatrics. So ger the GEMS class is an eight-hour class. I'm going to combine eight hours of lecture in just a little over an hour. So please bear with me. Don't try to write everything down. That's why I said if you'd like to have the PowerPoints, I'm happy to email them to you. If at some point we ever want to do a full GEMS program, um, I'm happy to do that for you here, and we certainly can host one. We can certainly host a GEMS program here. Um, I'll talk with Dr. Barinholtz and Joe afterwards if I had to do that if we want, and we can open it up. You know, we can have as many as 40 or 50 people, it doesn't matter. And that's eight hours of, of CEU. Now, I want to preface this by saying, I think that geriatric patients are the most complex and clinically challenging patients that we work with. They can also be some of the most rewarding patients that we work with. And I'll make a spoiler alert. I'm afraid sometimes that some of our younger EMS providers, their first experience with an older patient is a nursing home patient who has multiple comorbidities, is a DNRB, has G-tube, J-tube, Foley catheter, and it, it sort of sets up an age bias right away. I'd like to dispel that rumor right away. Um, it really isn't that way for older people. Older people are the most heterogeneous of all the cohort populations that we transport. And, and, and what I mean by that is children tend to develop socially, intellectually, physically sort of the same way. Most tod for the most part, one toddler is like another toddler, preschool, adolescent, a teenager. They all develop sort of the same way. With geriatric patients, it's quite different. One 65-year-old is quite different than another 65-year-old. So you really have to be very astute when you assess them, and, and we're going to talk about how to do that. So again, hang on for the ride. I'm, I'm going to put in, uh, in one hour, what would normally take eight hours to do. And in, the, in that eight-hour GEMS class, we also have some practical exercises, which we think are, are very beneficial to people, particularly our younger providers who really have had no experience with uh, older people. When I get a room full of younger providers, I say, how many people in here live in an extended family? Very few say yes. Um, they don't have any routine uh, contact growing up with grandparents or great-grandparents. And As I said before, the first contact they have is with uh, a nursing home patient. So I did download your uh, logo. So here we go. What we're going to talk about tonight I'm going to, we're going to review the aging population in Baltimore County, understand the aging process, understand the changes with age, understand the communication process with older people, which I think is very, very important. We're going to discuss trauma in older people, understand neurological emergencies and altered mental status, understand respiratory and cardiovascular emergencies, psychiatric emergencies, and understand elder abuse and neglect which I think is most, most important. Uh, I do have an hour lecture on uh, elder abuse if we ever want to delve a little bit further because I think really in most people, in older people's lives that are being abused either physically or emotionally, this is where we really can make the most difference. Because what we say is uh, no older person should have to spend the end of their lives in fear and deprivation. And unlike children who are very visible in the community, assisted living homes or in nursing homes, but who sees them all the time? We do. So who's in an ideal position to uh, assess for clues to elder abuse and neglect and make those reports? We are. So let's talk about a little bit about aging in the beginning. We're going to talk about the demographics of an aging society, talk about the aging population in Baltimore County. 
the social aspects of aging, and the negative stereotyping of older people, and talk about where older people live. Because I'll dispel a myth right now. Not every older person hits 65, gets very sick, moves into a nursing home and dies. It really couldn't be uh, farther from the truth. What we're witnessing now is something called the graying of America. For those of you that ever had sociology in college, there used to be sort of the, sort of the aging pyramid where the oldest of the old were at the top. Now that pyramid is starting to come out where we're seeing uh, the, the fastest growing segment of the population now is the, over, uh, is the 85 and above population. If you were born in 1900, you could expect to live to the ripe old age of 49. Now, somebody born today, uh, females can expect to live to age 78. Males can expect to live to the age of 76. Does anybody know what one significant event has really extended uh, life expectancy in the United States and around the world? The eradication of childhood diseases. That's the number one thing that has extended life expectancy in the United States. And the baby boomers now, the first baby boomers are those born between 1946 uh, and 1964, which I think some of us in this room fall in that category. But the first of the baby boom generation turned 65 in 2011. So that number is just going to continue to increase. That's why I said there's no more population pyramid. It's starting to spread out into a population rectangle. In Baltimore County, we have a unique situation. 12.5% uh, uh, of the United States population is over the age of 65. In Baltimore County, that number is 14.54. So we are ahead of... I just had a service dog on a call. I thought maybe he got loose. So we just... Um, we are ahead of those numbers. 14.54% of the county's population is over the age of 65. And we know that the 65 and older are the biggest percentage of users of EMS, so we see a lot of older people all the time. The number of females do outnumber males in this age group. Can anybody know why? It's the high-risk jobs that the baby boom generation engaged in. People, uh, and we look at, we can look at Dundalk at Sparrows Point as a prime example. There is a higher incidence of cancer, of certain kinds of cancers in Dundalk and Sparrows Point than anywhere else in the United States, and that's attributed to Sparrows Point Steel Mill that many of the older people worked uh, back in the day. Um, if you've been down there lately, it's completely gone. But the number of females do outnumber males pretty much three to one. And if you go in any nursing home the next time and take a look around, you'll see that the number of females do outnumber the males more than a ratio of three to one, and that's because of the high risk, um, high risk uh, jobs that older people engaged in before there were safety uh, concerns that we have now. So if you look at the, I have the age breakdown. Look at the number of of uh, 85 and above. Uh, it's growing exponentially, and we now we're now seeing people. The other day, our medic unit got dispatched for a 107-year-old female. So it's not uncommon to see the very the oldest of the old um, are, that are here. This is the one thing that I see a lot of healthcare providers, and we're guilty of that in EMS, is the stereotyping and discrimination of older people. One of the myths of aging is all older people are nasty, grouchy. They hit 65. They get lots of stuff wrong with them. They move into a nursing home, and they die. It really isn't that way. If you think about what the average person age 85 and above has seen in their lifetime, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, all the technological advances in our society they've lived through. And if you, if you actually take a minute and you talk to some older people about the jobs that they used to have, streetcar operator. Um, you know, I'm always... I'm always, I always love to talk to people who are over the age of 85 that were firemen in, in their previous careers. They, they just have such fascinating stories. And if you actually engage an older person and, and, and get them to talk about what they did for a living, it's fascinating. And, and they want to engage people. Um, I was the EMS program administrator at the Fire Academy for three years, and we didn't have, we didn't have any geriatric clinicals, and, and I initiated that. 
And the first thing I, I, I wanted people to do, they had to spend four hours in a senior center. Well, a lot of them completely against it. And, I, and they said, well, what do you want us to do? I said, I just want you to go in, and I want you to talk to people in the senior centers and just interview one of them. And I want you to come back with your life story. Well, when they came back, and then they had to do eight hours in a nursing home because I wanted them to see what it's really like because we do have some animosity between us and some of the staff, and I really wanted them to see what it's like every day to care for the ill and infirm in a nursing facility. But when they got back from the senior centers, they loved it. One of them got hustled for pool for all his money, but they, they really did enjoy uh, going to a senior center. If you ever want to see a lesson in healthy aging, go to Senior Olympics. I mean, these people will put us to shame. But uh, there is a lot of people who categorize older people as senile, eccentric, stubborn, and yes, some of them are. Uh, terms like geezer, lizard, gomer, they perpetuate aging. I, we taught at Gems out in Salt Lake City, and they call their old people taters. I'm not real sure why, but they do. Even the use of honey or deer is a milder form of ageism. Anytime you address somebody over the age of 65 as a patient, if you introduce yourself, call them by their, their given name. Mr. Smith, may I call you by your first name? What do you like to be called? Make that introduction because remember, remember the social mores and norms of people that age back then. You didn't call them by their first name. There was a certain amount of respect which they carry through their whole lives. Right now, where do all these older people live? Only 4.7% of the nation's older people reside in nursing homes. In Baltimore County, we have 47 nursing homes, 399 assisted living homes, and of the 47 nursing homes, that comes to almost 6,000 nursing home beds. But of the, of the 300 assisted living homes, many of them are ma and pa. Now, Sunrise is an exception, 3800 Old Court Road, that's the exception. Most of the assisted living homes in Baltimore County have between 2 and 15 beds. They're what they call the ma and pa nursing homes. But the majority of older people when they retire, continue to live at home and continue to be productive in their community long after retirement. In Japan, when you retire, I think the Japanese word for it is ikigai. That means when you retire in Japan, they find something for you to do. Product I'm not talking about being at Walmart or a greeter. They find something productive for you to do in your retirement age to keep you healthy, active, and engaged in society. But the majority of people tend to live at home, own their own home, long after retirement. Now, somebody today that retires at age 65, they can expect to live another 20 years after retirement. What do old people need? They need access to transportation. They need to be able to do meal preparation. They need access to health care. And they need to be socially engaged. And I, I'm of the belief that a person's, an older person's health care is directly predicated on their social, psychological, and environmental well-being. And I believe that. And we'll talk a little bit about why I think that is so later on. But these are the essential things that older people need. EMS is often the entry point for, most, for some older people. Uh, into the health care system, particularly the long-term care system, and we'll talk about that later. That's why some older people are reluctant to be transported to the hospital because they fear that we are the entry point for them into the long-term care facility, and they know somebody, the ambulance took them, and never saw them again. So what we know about the number of older people uh, is over 65 is rising in this country, particularly the oldest old, those over 85 and above, the fastest growing segment of the population. Older people have a lot of social and environmental concerns, which we will talk about uh, later. And listen, we have to understand and accept aging. You start to age the minute you're born. And here's what one of my EMTs said to me uh, many years ago. He said, the standard that we set today in EMS is the standard that we're going to be cared for when we're old by the next generation coming up in EMS. So watch what you do because it'll come back to haunt you. And the family remains the most common residence for older people. All right, what happens to you when you age? 
First of all, how do you know somebody's old? How do you know? Well, other than looking at him. <laughs> Listen, I see you driving a truck every now and then. So you thought, there's, a, there's a lesson in productive aging. The guy's throwing a stick the other day on a working fire. But listen, how do you know somebody's old? Well, first of all, we're going to talk about the major diseases and disorders common to older people. Ident identify the general decline in organ systems of older people, which we have to keep in mind as EMS providers. Explain the changes brought about from aging in physical structure, body composition, and organ function. These last two are paramount in everything that we do and how we treat older people clinically. And we're going to define the normal psychological changes affecting older people. All right. Here's my David Letterman top five list. Leading causes of death in older people. Diseases of the heart, cancer, TBA, stroke, COPD, and pneumonia. Do we see this in older people every day? We absolutely do. And those are the top five leading causes of death in older people. And by far, diseases of the heart uh, is the number one and remains the number one. So what happens to... The integumentary system, remember back from EMT and paramedic, the largest organ system in the body. What happens to the integumentary system in older people? The skin wrinkles, you have thinner skin, you have decreased fat, and some people get gray hair. Everybody's tried to, right here's an IV tech or a paramedic, how difficult is it to get a line on some older people? What holds your veins in place? Anybody know? Your subcutaneous fat, right? What do older people lose? They're, they have decreased fat. That's why you get these little rolly veins that roll around. You can take the gems class, we tell you how to overcome that. Um, thinner skin. That's why in the winter time, one of my pet peeves is don't leave the doors in the back of the medic unit open when it's 20 degrees. And steal some extra blankets from whatever hospital doesn't have a PIXIS system now. So, you know, because these older people, they, they do have thinner skin, they do have decreased fat, they cannot hold your body heat as well as younger people. I should have said this in the beginning. My definition of older people, anybody over the age of 65. That's sort of the common age Medicare, upon what, what body of literature you're reading or what discipline you're reading. Uh, other people use 60. Prison health systems, prison health system uses age 50 as defining what's older because if you look at the, the, the prison population, probably not the best health care, probably not the best life choices. So there are people who are 50 who present and look like they're 80 and have multiple comorbidities, as opposed to uh, a 90-year-old who's running a marathon in the Senior Olympics. So depending upon what body of literature you're looking at, some people use different ages. We use 65. That seems to be a general consensus in medicine. Um, help me with that. I, I believe it. Yeah. So that's usually the. So that's what we use. But this, the integumentary system. And again, everything, all the changes with ages, all the changes with age that older people go through, we can directly impact how we care for them and what we do to minimize risks. The aging respiratory system. There are changes in the airway, decreasing muscles of ventilation. How many older people with severe COPD or congestive heart failure, they get tired of breathing and then they stop. Uh, increased residual volume, decreased sensitivity of chemoreceptors. And as I said before, I know I'm, I'm gleaning over a lot of this. I just want you to just absorb what you can. But really, I want you to see how really complex and clinically challenging older people are. Um, the cardiovascular system, development of atherosclerosis, Decreased cardiac output, development of arrhythmias, and changes in blood pressure. The, change, I want you, the, the changes in blood pressure, I want you to hold on to that thought because when we talk about trauma, that's going to be very paramount. Now, the nervous system. Brain shrinkage, I'm worried about that myself. Um, slowing of peripheral nerves. About 1,000 older people die of burn-related injuries every year. And do you know how they do it? Activities of daily living, primarily cooking, because they, they don't sense it fast enough, uh, their clothes catch fire, but about 1,000 older people die, slow reflexes, they don't get their hand away from the stove, so about 1,000 older people die of burn-related injuries every year. And 
only because multiple comorbidities, severe burns, age, not a good combination. Uh, and decreased pain sensation. I want to stop right here and talk about uh, brain shrinkage. If a 35-year-old fell off your roof head first are you, and landed on his head on a concrete, are you likely to see manifestations of traumatic brain injury uh, very rapidly? Yes. If an older person fell from a standing height on this floor backwards and struck their head, are you likely to see the manifestations of traumatic brain injury in the time frame that we see these patients? The answer is no, maybe not. I've seen patients with traumatic, with, with a traumatic brain injury uh, bleeding in the brain of up to three or four days after the fall. And why is that? Brain shrinkage. Brain shrinkage. Because there's more time for blood to accumulate in the skull, so there's more time. It takes longer to become symptomatic with the, with the traditional traumatic brain injury uh, bleeding in the brain symptoms. So keep that in mind. We'll talk more about that in the trauma lecture. Uh, decreased pain sensation. Now, some of our providers, chest pain, for example, any kind of pain, they'll say, sir, and or madam, on a scale of 1 to 10, please rate the pain, uh, 10 being the worst pain that you've ever had. Anybody with any cognitive impairment over 65 is not going to be able to distinguish 2 out of 10, 5 out of 10, and remember, they have decreased pain sensation. So what might be a 7 out of 10 for a 35-year-old or a 50-year-old might be a 3 or a 4 for an 80-year-old. So rather than knowing this, so rather than using the pain rating scale and using the words pain, ask about discomfort. And don't ask any older person with any kind of cognitive impairment to rate 1 out of 10, 7 out of, They're not going to be able to do it, and it's, going to, it's not going to be valid, in my opinion, because they can't make that determination. Ask them about, uh, use a different word. Instead of pain, uh, pressure. Does anything hurt you? Where does it bother you? You may get a more descriptive... Uh, now, it does take longer to interview older people, so you may have to slow this down a little bit and don't fire questions at them, and this whole 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10 chest pain. No. Ask about pressure. Where does it hurt you? What bothers you? How do you feel? Rather than using a pain rating scale. Sensory changes. Vision distorts and eye movement slows. Hearing loss is more common and taste decreases. That's why you go to a restaurant and man, they're just the salt shakers just going wild. But what's the, uh, and hearing loss, what's the first thing that they, older, what's the first kind of hearing older people tend to lose? High pitch or low pitch? High pitch, right. To find a guy with the deepest voice to ask the question. Vision distorts and eye movement slows. This is why steps uh, for people with any kind of vision, big problem. And in the GEMS class, we actually have an exercise where we have, uh, we have the, you could buy, they're professionally made, that you put the glasses on and it, um, it mimics uh, cataracts, it mimics uh, uh, glaucoma, and then we give you a telephone, a page out of a telephone book to try to read it or we give you a prescription bottle and ask you to try to read it. The average person aged 65 to 74 is on five to seven different kinds of medications. The older you are, the more comorbidities, the more meds you're on. But you put the glasses on, you try to read the prescription bottles, forget it. And we, have, we were taught, teaching in San Francisco, we had a guy put them on, he kept them on the rest of the day because he couldn't believe how difficult it was to, to, to do this. Anyway, and taste decreases, hearing loss is more common. So that's why we're talking about this in communication. One of my pet peeves is when you're interviewing older people, one person please ask the questions. Get down to eye level, talk slow, and ask questions. A and if they have a hearing aid or they have glasses and they don't have them on, ask them where it is. Can I help you put on your hearing aid? Can I help you put on your, your glasses? Because if they're transported to the emergency department and they're admitted, and they don't have a hearing aid or they don't have glasses, it's going to be a long, difficult admission process. Um, psychological changes, depression, anxiety, adjustment disorders, very common in older people. Um, older people attempt suicide less, but they're more successful at it. Older men use weapons because, look, what, what did they grow up with? They've been through the war. They own guns. Guns are part of their culture. An 85-year-old man, guns are part of their culture. Uh, older men tend to use more lethal means of ending their lives than older women. 
Older women tend to use a softer method like um, a prescription overdose. But we're seeing a trend here. Older women are committing suicide by hanging. We're not really understanding why that's a... It's not older men, it's older women. So we're not really sure why that, that phenomenon is occurring. But uh, older people attempt suicide less, but they're more successful at it because a lot of them feel they've lived their lives long enough and they want to die. So when so, an older person tells you they want to die, don't blow it off. Take it seriously because they mean it. Adjustment disorder, somebody that's forced from their home to an assisted living home or to a nursing home, you can figure out that there's going to be adjustment disorders. What happens to renal, hepatic, and GI system? Well, kidneys become smaller. Hepatic blood flow decreases. Production of enzymes declines. Sal salivation decreases and gastric motility slopes. How many ALS providers in the room? Good. Does, does the, does, should this affect the way we give our medication doses to older people? Yes, it absolutely should. Um, you know, it's the same. I, I don't think general practitioners get it. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of older people have difficult... Yes, Jeff? The carrier proteins for drugs decrease as people get older, so people become much more sensitive to the drug, older people, so you have to decrease the dose. Usually, I think the OR, I cut the dose in half, and they get age 70. Yeah. And have the exact same effect. Excellent, excellent point. You know, a lot of people were on sleep aids. I had a gentleman... Uh, he was, <coughs> he was in, I think he was in Charlestown. They found him in the middle of the night. He was naked out in the hallway, sound asleep, because his family practitioner put him on a dose of um, Ambien, 10 milligrams. Instead of cutting in half, he gave him 10. He got up to go to the bathroom, walked out in the hallway, thought that was a bedroom, laid down, went to sleep. So I took the liberty of calling the family physician the next morning and said, you might want to cut that in half. But see, and... And, and, and I'll, I'll jump ahead right now. If you do nothing more than gather a thorough medication history from an older person, prescription, over-the-counter, and uh, uh, um, herbal, because the 65 to 74-year-old age group, uh, the baby, they tend to use more herbal meds than the oldest old, but they, because now you're talking about the hippie generation, they were into herbal meds in the 60s, so it's not uncommon that they're into herbal meds now. I'm talking about over-the-counter herbal meds. So... Uh, prescription, over-the-counter, and herbal medication, rather than thorough medication history, and give that to the emergency department physician, uh, you've done a lot. All right, musculoskeletal system. There's a decrease in muscle mass. There's changes in posture, there's arthritic changes, and there's a decrease in bone mass. Um, and there's a 20% mortality in people who suffer a hip fracture. The older you are, the more likely you are to fall in that 20%, and it's typically the oldest old. But, you know, a fall from a standing height can, can be devastating for an older person with osteoporosis, brittle bone disease, um, because of those age-related changes. Decrease in bone mass, arthritic changes, changes in posture. People who are kyph, everybody, everybody knows what kyphosis is. There's three kinds of, uh, of curvature. There's bilateral lordosis, scoliosis, kyphosis. But older people with kyphosis, they sort of have that humped posture. They are really more tend, they are more prone to falls because of the kyphosis. And we'll talk about backboarding somebody with kyphosis versus not backboarding somebody with curvature of the spine. Um, the EMT instructors in the room always give me a dirty look, but we'll talk about why you probably shouldn't do it. But, you know, a fall from a standing height can be devastating. It can result in a hip fracture. Um, it can result in uh, long bone fractures because of those age-related changes. Uh, changes in the immune system. They have a less effective immune response. Pneumonia and UTIs are common. Uh, what's the first presenting sign of, 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 of pneumonia and a UTI in the older population? I'll give you a hint. It's not the iced tea-colored uh, uh, Foley bag. Yeah. Uh, altered mental status is, is the first presenting symptom uh, of a UTI and pneumonia in older people. Uh, increase in abnormal immune system substances. Anybody know what the fastest growing segment of the population to become HIV positive is? The older, the, the over 65 population. Now we could talk about socially why maybe that's so, the Viagra 
You can make your own conclusions. But the over 65 population is the fastest growing same on the population to become HIV positive. So, in summary, the aging body has decrease in muscle and bone, changes in body structure, less ability to compensate for stress. Psychological changes often caused by stress encountered in an older population. And listen, do we cause some of that stress? Listen, we do what we do. We do it very well. We come in, we assess. We have very little amount of time to come in, assess the problem, decide what we're going to do clinically to treat people, and to get them to the emergency department. With older people, and I don't care what the call volume is, and at any given day in this county, when you encounter an older person, slow it down a little bit. Take more time to interview. Take more time to find out what the problem is. Because remember what I said in the beginning, I truly believe an older person's health care is directly predicated on their social, psychological, and environmental well-being. And sometimes you have to play detective. You have to figure these things out. We'll talk a little bit more uh, about how to do that. And take, always take an older person's suicide seriously. But, you know, be careful. You know, an older person with a, a 38 revolver will hurt you as much as a 20-year-old with a... But here's the thing about suicidal uh, older people versus younger people. They don't want to take you out. They don't want to kill you and everybody else in the room. They just want to end their own lives. But I, I say that uh, there's a modicum of discretion there. Just please be careful because, you know, they can hurt you as well. That's my grandmother and I. She was 98 at the time when we did the first GEMS book. Uh, they brought us models who were in their 30s to do it. I'm like, no, no, we need old people. So she's 98. She had a little bit of kyphosis, and she was very good. She laid on the board on the floor for like an hour, but it was good. Now, we're going to talk about the principles and strategies of communicating effectively, which I think is one of the most important chapters uh, and one of the most important things we talk about in, in GEMS. What are common communication challenges with older patients? And we have to recognize their emotional need for independence in older people. You cannot walk into an over-65 person's home and tell them what we're going to do. We have to ask their permission. And we have to be good sellers and sort of sell what we want to do. Because remember, one of them, take them out of the house, they ain't never going to be seen again. Because I guarantee you they know somebody that that happened to. Common fears in older people that interfere with communication. Uh, recognize and responding to caregiver stress which is really a big deal because it is a, a, a big emotional and sometimes financial burden for a loved one to care for an aging relative, particularly an aging relative with any kind of cognitive dysfunction. It can be often frustrating, and if you're not emotionally prepared to do it, it, it ends in disaster. Um, when you talk to older people, particularly the hearing loss, vision disturbances, you, you have to position yourself face to face. You know, I walked in not too long the other day, and there's an older person in a chair, and here's the provider behind them with a pad interviewing them. Don't do that. If you can, sit down face-to-face, eye-level-to-eye level, talk slow, and communicate only one idea at a time. And when, because depending upon the type of call, you could have four on the engine, two on the medic, somebody like me shows up in a supervisor car, and everybody wants to talk to them. One person, probably the paramedic that's going to be, or the provider that's going to be transporting them to the hospital, get that rapport, and you do the interview. You know what questions to ask. It's, it's no, the same questions we're going to ask for most other people apply to geriatric patients, but one person needs to do it. Not this person, not that person, because if they have any kind of cognitive dysfunction, they're going to be confused, and they don't know who to focus on. And we fire questions to people rapidly, because we've got to get a lot of information in a short amount of time, but we've got to just slow it down a little bit when it comes to older people. Turn the lights up. If you go in a dark room, turn the lights up if there's any kind of visual disturbances so they can see you. Assist them with their glasses or their hearing aid. Uh, use uh, touch to calm and reassure. Hand on the shoulder tends to work very well. Also tends to focus them if, if they get non-focused. And don't assume that blind means deaf. Uh, a lot of providers do that. The, 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 if they can't see, they just talk real loud. Uh, you don't have to. Speak to the good ear, raise the volume, and lower the tone of the pitch. Because remember, the, the first part of the hearing that goes is high pitch. Anybody know what aphasia is? Everybody knows what aphasia is? It's, it's an it's a inability to understand or produce speech, most often the result of a stroke. And there's lots of different kinds of aphasia. There's a global aphasia, expressive aphasia. 
it's difficult for us not knowing the patient, what type of aphasia that they have. If there is a concerned family member or a care provider, they may know because some patients with aphasia, they can understand what you say to them. They just can't express it back to you. So we, the people with global aphasia, they can either understand or they can express. But people with expressive aphasia, they can understand what you say to them if you keep the jargon out of it and you keep it very simple. It's usually due to a brain injury. The thing with aphasic patients, focused, simple questions. Nothing complicated because, again, we don't know them. We don't know what type of aphasia they have, how severe the, 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 the brain injury is. And give the aphasic patient time to respond. I know we're in a hurry, but again, particularly with patients with aphasia, dementia, any kind of communication disorder, you have to take your time. Simple, focused questions. Use gestures and visual aids if you have to. Um, let me go back to, well, I'll talk about this, because really the same things apply. Um, clear, concrete, familiar language. Convey only one idea at a time. Okay, now let me say, let me go back to aphasic patients for a minute. Some aphasic patients, they hear every conversation in the room. Okay, so sometimes if, if you can't focus, um, yesterday we were at the uh, Shkamuno, there were 300 people in the room, and this guy was in his 70s, and it was noise everywhere, and everybody wanted to help, and we had the engine crew, the medic crew, myself. We just had to get him up on a stretcher and out to the medic where it was a nice, quiet environment because some aphasic patients they hear every conversation in the room and they may or may not focus on what you're telling them or what you need them to to uh, what you need them to focus on convey only one idea at a time and give them time to respond and don't use medical jargon uh, and use very short sentences accompany words with gestures don't give lengthy explanations and use nouns instead of pronouns don't say um, if you were talking about if this is the patient and this is his daughter, I told her we're going to go to Sinai. No, I told your daughter, Mary, we're going to Sinai. Does anybody know what the last thing in your memory to go is? Specific, right, name. Your name and the names of your children. Last things in your memory to go. Your name and the names of your children. So use nouns instead of pronouns. I told Mary we're going to Sinai. I told her it, it doesn't mean anything. What are some of the common fears older people have uh, uh, th that may affect how we communicate with them? Well, some of them are why we're there. What are we going to do? Where are we going to take them? Who's going to turn the lights off? Who's going to lock the door? Who's going to turn the heat down? Who's going to take care of the dog? Anybody not heard those things in, in, even in your short-lived careers? You have. Here's what they fear. Loss of independence. Somebody's going to make all their decisions for them. You have to allow them to make their own decisions. And I know it takes longer. People who are older people that are reluctant to go to the hospital, I like them to make the choice. Rather than, even though we know they've got to go, and they're going to go, even if they don't have, if somebody else got their medical power of attorney, I think it's always better that they make the decision because they, one of the things they fear is loss of independence. The other thing they fear is they're never going to leave the hospital because they don't know somebody who went to the hospital and never saw them again. They, they fear that they're going to be in a nursing home. Separation anxiety. It's not uncommon for us to go into a home, find an older person that we are going to transport who has multiple comorbidities and who is the care provider that, of somebody else, in, a spouse that's in a hospital bed. Can't leave them there. So separation anxiety separate from the dog, separate from the home, separate from the people in the home. Pet care and household security. Who's going to lock the house? Who's going to take care of the dog? Those kind of things are, are, are very paramount to them. Remember, socialization could very well be their source, sole source of socialization. Medical expenses. I mean, you go into people's homes, they cut their medications in half. 
because they can't afford them, or they don't take them at all because they can't afford them. They don't want to go to the hospital because they don't want a bill. And remember, generational differences in older people. Um, Medicaid, social programs, um, they don't want any of that because they see that as a handout um, and they don't want anything to do with it. You know, so it, it, even though you tell them, look, you know, there, there's resources available, they see that as a government handout. They want nothing to do with it. So you kind of have to dis, you know, sort of dissuade that, that, you know, it's, it's okay to go to the hospital if you don't have the money to pay for it. Recognizing caregiver stress. This is a, um, a problem because the older population is increasing and oftentimes a reluctant child becomes the caregiver. And there, it, it, it does take a lot to care for somebody with dementia or has suffered a stroke or is aphasic. Uh, they may be living in the same home. Uh, they moved into the home where the care provider is. It is very stressful. And just because there may be an abuse and neglect problem in the home, it doesn't always mean, it very seldom means, that the uh, older person is going to be separated indefinitely from the care provider. Um, even, and regardless of how we feel about it, this is a problem. There's physical effects on the caregiver, emotional effects on the caregiver, uh, effects on the patient and other family members. So what are ways that we can reduce caregiver stress? I think Medicaid has a um, respite. Uh, they'll pay for respite care if the, older per if the, if the care provider has to... to you know, do something, get away, or whatever, they will pay for respite, respite care. And is a child caring for one or both parents uh, in the home or uh, away from the home? Because we know that a lot of older people don't want to move out of their home. So is, is, the, is the, the primary care provider care, taking care of their own family and then having to go to the parent's home to take care of one or both parents? It, is, it can be, I'm sure, very, very stressful. So we talked about some of the communications and challenges, effective principles of effective communication, the older person's need for emotional independence, some of the common fears that older people have, and the caregiver stress. Let's talk about trauma. I think this is, here's my, here's my spiel on trauma. Older people are less likely to be transported to a trauma center simply based upon age. And we found that hard to believe. So I chair the state's geriatric EMS advisory committee. And in 2007, uh, Dr. David Chang from Hopkins, uh, he, he did a study published in the Archives of Surgery 2007. I forgot what month. But we, we did some informal survey data, and this is what it, and there's two things that came back from our own EMS providers in our state, that they didn't feel older people were worthy of a trauma center bed based upon the fact that they were old, they thought they should be reserved for the younger people. And a lot of it was provider education. They did not understand that less mechanism, and here, I'll cut to the chase right now, less mechanism always equals more significant trauma in older people. So based upon lack of education and provider bias, they were reluctant to transport older people. So we should have expanded out this because we had one small control group and we went around to five different, all the five different regions in our state and we did interviews and survey data, and we came back with the same thing. They don't feel older people are worthy of a trauma bed because they feel that they're going to die anyway, and lack of provider education. The literature is mixed, but I would say over 50% of the literature says if older people are treated aggressively and transported to a trauma center, they will fare out just as well as their younger counterparts. But the aggressive care has to begin in the field. So don't be reluctant to transport a geriatric patient. I don't care if they're, if they're 99 or 66. Don't be afraid to transport them to a trauma center. And you know, the, the, the politics of this is, how many pediatric trauma centers do we have around in the United States? Designated pediatric trauma centers? Quite a few. How many designated geriatric trauma centers do we have in the United States? None. Should there be a model? Maybe. I'm not sure. Politically, we don't talk about it here in Maryland, but, you know, should there be? I mean, Johns Hopkins Bayview has an outstanding 
uh, 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 geriatric program. They're also a satellite trauma center. I'm not sure if, if there is the model. Geriatrician comes, geriatrician, trauma surgeon comes down to see the patient. Geriatrician follow the patient uh, in their course of, of, of hospital stay. I wonder what the outcome would be. I'm not sure. Um, talk about the epidemiology and trauma in older people. Discuss it. assessment findings in older people with traumatic injuries and talk about the management of the trauma patient. Risk factors for older people that are prone to falls. Essential components of assessing a fall. I have a couple of good mnemonics. Um, and strategies to use to prevent falls. Leading cause of traumatic deaths in older people. Falls, followed by motor vehicle crashes, followed by birth. There are fewer motor vehicle crashes, but with more severe injuries. Listen, older people are very cognizant about how other people feel about them being on the road. And you don't see a lot of geriatric patients wrapping around a tree at 2 in the morning because they just left the bar. Most of the older people tend to be off the road by dark, the majority of them. Um, most people 75 or 80 are not buying new cars. They're still driving the Buick from the 1970s. Now they're built like battleships, but what don't they have in them? They don't have airbags. They don't have all these crumple points and all this other kind of stuff that the new cars have. Um, and it's a very, it's a political, it's a very political discussion when you talk about driving and age and how to have that discussion with your older parent and maybe you shouldn't drive. Uh, the police have gotten on board with this because there are ways of assessing a driver. You know, uh, which came first? They hit the tree. Did they have a, did a medical incident cause the accident? Did an accident cause the medical conditions like the chicken or the egg? You don't really know. So, it, you know, the discussion itself is very political, but how we assess that, for our purposes, medical emergency before the crash, medical emergency after the crash, our purpose is clinically, how are they, what are we going to do about it? Um, we talked about burns already, about a thousand older people die of uh, burns every year, mostly from activities uh, of daily living. Penetrating trauma, less common in older people, they're not getting capped. Um, it's usually blunt trauma, and the physical injury from elder abuse um, is, is, can be very problematic. How does aging affect trauma? We talked a little bit about, you have to keep those age-related changes in mind when you assess uh, geriatric trauma patients, particularly with a significant mechanism of injury. Decreased pulmonary function and abilities. Heart's hard to increase cardiac output. Remember, we talked about the whole brain shrinkage thing, musculoskeletal system. Changes uh, increase the chance of injury. Kyphotic people are more prone to fall. There's a 20% morbidity, I'm sorry, mortality in people that suffer a hip fracture. The older you are, the more likely you are to fall in that 20%. Let's talk about medication, for example. Um, beta blockers. What effects do beta blockers have? All right, first of all, what happens uh, in trauma? Bleed, for example. Blood pressure goes how? Blood pressure goes down. Pulse rate goes up. Here's your bleeding. In geriatric patients who are on beta blockers, what are you not likely to see as a result of trauma? you're not likely to see a significant increase in the heart rate because of the effects of the beta blocker, even though the blood pressure may be down. And remember, geriatric, patient, geriatric trauma patients with a history of hypertension who, after suffering a significant trauma, have a blood pressure of 100 or 110 systolic, they may be in profound shock. So keep that in mind. Beta blockers, you're not going to see that classic increase in heart rate. Uh, people, older people with high blood pressure, you may or may not see that, uh, rather that, that classic, we want to get their perfusion to 100 to 110. They may be profoundly uh, hypertensive after a significant trauma. Everybody familiar with the trauma triad? Acidosis, uh, hypothermia, coagulopathy. In geriatric patients, this is more profound. What do they lose? Body fat. What do you have to do, especially the geriatric trauma patients? You've got to keep them warm. You've got to keep them perfused. Now, you know, there's some, and I want the docs in the room to help me out with this. You know, you don't want to overload 
trauma patients, particularly geriatric trauma patients with fluid, if you can keep their pressure between 90 and 100, I think we've done the right thing. I think we probably yeah, agree with this. Yeah, the idea is that they have prepared cardiac function as they get older, they don't squeeze, they don't have as much hydrotrophy. So if we give them more fluid, they may not be able to handle that fluid. So if we can keep their pressure between 90 and 100, we've done a good thing. But keep those Keep the vital sign parameters in mind when you assess geriatric trauma patients. What could be causing a lack of an elevated heart rate? You know, what medications are they, are, are they, are they taking? And that's why I said if you do nothing more than gather a thorough medication history, take it to the hospital, you've done a good thing. Thoracic and lumbar spine injuries increase in older people. Upper extremities can have a high loss of function. Less able to tolerate pelvic injuries. We talked about that. Hip fractures are debilitating and can be fatal. Lower extremity fractures can occur with less force. Um, remember, less mechanism equals more significant trauma. We talked about the fact that geriatric trauma patients are less likely to be transported. We have got to overcome that in EMS. We've got to overcome that. Be aggressive with your, in management of your geriatric trauma patients because they will decompensate more. Spinal immobilization. Those that have been around in the room a long time, we've been back and forth over it, mobilize, don't immobilize. We teach our EMT students, if you're going to immobilize, they've got to be flat on the board, and the straps have to be tight. Can you do that with somebody that's kyphotic? Absolutely not. You will do more harm than good if you try to immobilize somebody on a backboard with kyphosis. Because the other thing that can happen is, first of all, you're going to call some pain cause damage. Second of all, the kyphotic patients, when you lay them flat, does their head lay flat? No. You try to lay a, a kyphotic, sometimes their head can be this far off the board or off the stretcher. You've got to pad that because you can cause muscle and ligament damage in, the, in, the, in a severely kyphotic patient if you try to lay them flat and you don't support the head. So consider alternatives to spinal immobilization. What's a good spinal immobilization device for somebody with severe kyphosis? orthopedic frame. Where's the opening in the orthopedic frame? Right in the middle. But, and what does it do? It, it cradles the hip. So consider alternative methods. Somebody with a hip fracture. You don't have a pelvic. Is the backboard good for, for hip fractures? Probably not. What can you use? How about a keyboard? Turn it upside down and then side out. Pad it. Go to the uh, come and you can use the, the Green. Yes. He's right. Where, listen, what are ER wait times now? And somebody that sits in a hallway bed, huh? Yes. Yeah. Could be devastating because remember, what can you do to try to prevent that? If you're going to put them on a board, consider high post. Those short steps. The
heart disease, number one cause of death, COP, pneumonia, the fourth and fifth leading causes of death. Respiratory and cardiovascular diseases are more likely in later years. Uh, I want to say something about older people who live... I, I, I try to think of things. Anybody works in a part-time or anybody works in a rural area, older people in a rural area tend to use EMS less than their urban counterparts. But when they do, they tend to be sicker with the big three, cardiovascular, uh, respiratory, and stroke. Just tidbits. A study, that first study came out in Denver, but later it was done to populations around the country and intended to, to, to hold true. Psychiatric emergency in older people, we'll talk quickly about that. Uh, it affects 2 million older people in the United States. 30% of older patients in nursing homes suffer from some form of clinical depression. I don't think we have to reach far to see why that is. Uh, red flags for depression, frequent non-urgent calls or trips to the ED or doctor visits. The severity of the complaint is unequal to the findings. Personal neglect, lack of social support, and lack of a sense of enjoyment. Remember what I said, an older person's health care is directly predicated on their social, psychological, and environmental well-being. Manage, managing a person's depression, older person's depression. They should be transported, they should be referred accordingly. A um, lot of literature on uh, geriatric. Uh, there, there are uh, psychologists that, that do specialize in geriatric care. I think Shepard Pratt has a, a geriatric psych program. I'm not sure if other hospitals do, but it should be the entry point. Um, treatment usually includes medication or therapy. Socialization goes a long way to prevent depression uh, in older people. We talked a little bit about this more. Older males. The older males have one of the highest suicide rates. Younger people attempt it more. Older people are more successful. Uh, and older men, I should put men in there, tend to use more lethal means. Men commit, older men commit suicide four times more than older women. Uh, circumstances that increase the risk for suicide, older people, death of a loved one. How many people do you know been married 50, 60 years, spouse dies, other spouse is dead in six months? Physical illness, depression, isolation, Substance abuse and loss of life roles. Loss of life roles is a big one. Uh, red flags, again, uh, preoccupation with death, giving away prized possessions, taking unnecessary risks, increase of alcohol and drugs, medication non adherence. I'm tired of taking it. I'm ready. I had an old person tell me not too long ago, I'm not taking them. I'm 90 some years old. I'm ready to die. They mean it and getting a weapon. Ask them, are you contemplating suicide? If they say yes, take the older person seriously. Secure dangerous items and arrange for transport. And please report these uh, concerns to the emergency department. Not only the physician, but the nurse. And if you can find a social worker, do it there too. Substance abuse in older people is on the rise. It's not something that's talked about, um, but it is something now that's coming uh, up in the, the geriatric literature. It includes the misuse of alcohol, illicit drugs, and medications. It is underreported in the older population. You know, the literature I read, about 10% are chemically dependent. Who knows? It's probably a lot higher. All right. Last lecture, elder abuse. I think it's particularly important because I think as EMS providers, we can do a lot about. Elder abuse in this country is called the, the most underreported crime of this century because... Older people who are abused are often alone. They don't get out much. But who sees them all the time? We do. Are we trained to look for the red flags of elder abuse? No. Uh, Thirty-some years ago, we all took our EMT and didn't even talk about it. Some textbooks now devote a three paragraphs. They'll define elder abuse, elder neglect, and self-neglect, and that's the end of it. That's all. So we are with elder abuse now where we were with child abuse 25 years ago. So it's got to... It's, Elder abuse now is starting to come to the nation's forefront, which I think uh, is very important. What is the definition of abuse? Depending upon what literature you're reading, you get different uh, definitions. But it's an all-inclusive term that represents all types of abuse. It can be an act of commission, abuse, an act of omission, neglect, intentional or unintentional, and it can be physical, psychological, financial abuse and neglect, 
uh, that results in unnecessary suffering, injury, pain, loss, or violation of human rights, and it can, it can and it does decrease the quality of their life. Only two, two significant studies that I know of, one was done in 1996 that looked at uh, elder abuse of people. I think this is way outdated. It really hasn't been updated that much. Half a million people, one in ten older people have been abused. Who knows? It's really the most underreported crime because if a nursing home patient's being abused or neglected, can they really report that? No. They have no means to report it. it, it is, uh, it's true that older people who get frequent visits at a nursing home are less likely to be abused than those who never get visits. But again, who comes in and sees them? We do. In 2001, the U.S. House of Representatives actually did a study where they looked at nursing home abuse and of the 5,283 nursing homes they looked at, almost one in three were cited for violations of abuse. And when they did survey data of nursing home workers, one in three said that they either physically or emotionally abused a nursing home resident in the last six months. Those are the ones that are honest. This is not a very good... Neglect is by far the most common form of abuse followed by physical abuse. And yes, sexual abuse is very common in older people. Uh, everybody knows what a pedophile is. If you look at the social literature, you look at the law enforcement literature, there's a new kind of, it's called a gerophile. These are sexual predators of older people. Where do they get jobs? Nursing homes. There is no national uh, database of nursing home workers. If you are uh, convicted of sexual assault of a nursing home patient in Pennsylvania and you come down to Maryland to get a job, nobody's likely to know about it. There's no registry. Yeah, Andrea. Sorry. There is It isn't, and it's a shame. It's not really good, but if you go into a nursing, well, that's good to know. Um, there's also a res website called Nursing Home Compare. You can look at the survey data of every nursing home in the United States. Just look at some of them around here. You can anecdotally we go to them. We know which ones we like, which ones we don't. We can make that choice. If you go into a nursing home and there's a sudden outbreak of STDs, you got a little problem. Older women, rectal vaginal bleeding, one of two reasons. They have cervical cancer, or they've been sexually assaulted. I also wrote a textbook, uh, Social Gerontology for Law Enforcement, where violent, violent, violent crimes against older women. They're beaten. They're penetrated. Uh, these are the, the people who are, are, are gerophiles, and violent offenders are committing those crimes. It's, it's the literature. It's, I mean, it, you read it. It's not much on it, but it's just it's unbelievable. So they're out there, and we see them. Unfortunately, so there should be a high index of suspicion. Don't try to examine. That's not what, you know, the, 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 those patients are transported to the same uh, rape centers that we have for younger patients. But, and there, older people, particularly nursing home patients, uh, because of musculoskeletal changes, they often have more significant trauma other than vaginal trauma, musculoskeletal trauma. So you have to look at all that. It does exist. It is out there. We can't, we can't, Close our eyes to it because it's there. Uh, who are the major perpetrators of abuse and neglect? Older children and spouses. Adult children and not older children. Adult children and spouses. Number one, number two forms uh, types of, of perpetrators. Physical abuse is, is force resulting in bodily injury, hitting, slapping, burning, unwarranted administration of drugs and, and restraints. Force feeding and physical punishment. I was attending a lecture uh, on elder abuse at uh, Bayview one day, and Dr. Mark Lax, I think he's from, from Boston, he's a geriatrician. He had a slide of, of an older woman, and the son just, I don't know, I don't know what happened, but she had a hot iron imprint right here, right across it. I tried to get the slide, but I couldn't. You know, when you look at Sadly enough, there are a lot of forensic photographs of 
child neglect and abuse that we can look at. That body of literature simply is not there for geriatric patients. It's very hard to come by forensic photographs of injury patterns from elder abuse. I, I try to find them so we can, we can talk about them, we can see them so you can see them, so if you see them in your practice, you know what to look for. Because a lot of these things are subtle. Sexual abuse, we talked about that. Uh, neglect. Neglect is the refusal or failure to provide life necessities such as food, water, clothing, shelter, personal hygiene, medicine, comfort, or personal safety. Do you have to be a paid care provider to be guilty of neglect? The answer is no. If you are a care provider, family member, who is responsible for the care of the older adult, you are just as culpable under the law as if you were paid. And failure of a paid care provider to provide that necessary care, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a paid care provider. Emotional, psychological abuse, infliction of anguish, emotional pain, or distress. It includes verbal assaults, threats, intimidation, harassment, and forced social isolation. I wanted to... Uh, let, me, let me say this about elder abuse. Economic boundaries. It occurs in the very rich and it occurs in the very poor. This is not, this is not a, 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 a socially stratified problem. Walking through a very, listen, we work in, 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 a, in, a, in a nice community and we have very nice homes where we, where we respond to calls. I walk into an, an older, a, a nice big house up in the valley where an older person, I don't know, it was a complaint, trouble breathing or something like that. I said, where is the patient? Down the stairs. Went down the stairs into a back room where the furnace and the, and, the, and the hot water heater was, and there's the old person in the hospital bed. No windows, no egress in the basement because they didn't want people to see that they had an older person they were caring for, that that person was ultimately removed. Since I've been at EMS 5, I've been personally responsible for the closing of two assisted living homes, which I say I'm very proud of. I walked in one, everybody in there had a black eye because the care provider was punching them all in the eye. They were closed within 24 hours. So don't think you can't make a difference, because we can. Huh? Well, I called the police, first of all, uh, social services, adult protective services, the mayor and attorney general's office, and they were, and they were, and they, within 24 hours, everybody was moved out, and the two owners were arrested and charged. Absolutely. Request to pol My suggestion is, if you suspect it, request the police or request the district officer. Jeff. Well, here's what I'm going to say about that. We are, we are a man, under, under the annotated code of Maryland, we are mandated, EMS providers are mandated reporters of child abuse. Under the annotated code of Maryland, we are not mandated reporters of elder abuse. We are, according to the protocol, 20, 24 states have laws on their books that specifically enumerate paramedics, EMTs, as firefighters, as mandated reporters. Maryland is not one of them. So if you think you can't advocate for older people, you can. And, and I've been knocking on the doors of Annapolis for several years saying the language and the family law of the annotated Colonel Maryland has got to include EMTs, firefighters, and paramedics, which right now it does not. So for those, you get, huh? Don't ask me. True. Now, Baltimore County has a very strong... Listen, we're very lucky in this county. I teach GEMS all across the country, and I ask how many EMS systems have regular contact and relationships with their local departments of aging. Very few, if any, say that they do. We have an excellent relationship in this county with our Department of Aging and our Department of Social Services and the ombudsman. Every nursing home should have an ombudsman. Some do, most do in this county. Some don't. But the ombudsman, 887-4200, is the ombudsman's number. If you see something in a nursing home, you call the ombudsman. You request a DO, huh? I have a friend in one, and she was being neglected terribly. And I said, well, let me get the ombudsman. And she said, no, because as soon as she leaves, I'm going to be treated even worse. Well, that's true, and that's, a, and that's a big fear. But we can make a difference, particularly in the lives of older people in nursing homes, because we are their advocates. We should be their advocate. 
Financial material exploitation, this is not something we routinely ask older people, but if they volunteer it, try to go down that path. Sometimes they, that we, have a, we, have a, we have a patient in uh, a 14 box who uh, very well to do, lives by herself, husband died, she had a paid care pr provider, she gave the paid care provider access to her checking account, her savings account, wiped her clean. Wiped her clean. By the time the detectives got involved, she had left the country. Wiped her out. But if, but if they say something like that, delve into it a little bit. Uh, Self-neglect, behaviors on the part of the older person that can threaten their own lives. This is a problem. If a child is being neglected, you can intervene. If a person is... Eight, listen, there's a big difference between... There is a fine line, rather, between being eccentric, being self-neglecting. If an older person is of sound mind and chooses to live a particular way and understands the possible consequences of living the way they do in their own home, sadly enough, there's very little we can do. Now, I will tell you that that person is, like, is probably going to digress where intervention is going to become necessary, but if they're of their own sound mind, they want to live the way they do, there's very little we can do about it. And those are the sad cases. Uh, see. Risk factors for domestic violence. In the older person, poor health, functionally impaired, because they, they take more care. Those that are cognitively impaired, those older people that have a drug or alcoholism problem, where there is financial dependency and strain, social isolation, and where there's a history of violence in the family. And I'll tell you an interesting point. I'm trying to get us out of here. I'll tell you an interesting point, though. The Humane Society of the United States actually made the connection between violence against animals and violence against older people. Most serial killers, you go back, the law enforcement people know this, you go back to their childhood, they were abusing animals. If there's an animal in the house and they're being abused or neglected and there's an old person in the house is it being, that's also there, there's a very, very high probability they're also being abused and neglected. And, and the Humane Society was the one who actually made that, first brought that out in the literature, but the literature does bear it out. Uh, risk factors for institutional abuse. Every nursing home is required to have an abuse prevention policy and the trained staff. Does it happen all the time? No. What happens in nursing homes that have a high staff turnover ratio or a history of deficiency and complaints, those are the nursing homes at risk for more abusing their uh, 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 older people. Residents with dementia, aggression, and, and a high level of dependence are more apt to be abused. The nursing home patients who don't get regular visitors are more apt to be abused. What can we do as EMS providers? Look at the scene survey. Every older person's house that I go in that I suspect they're neglected, the first place I go is right to the refrigerator. Open the refrigerator. What do they got in there? How do they get their meals? If they can't provide their own, if they can't do their own ADLs, which includes meal preparation, who is doing it for them? How are they getting their meals? Uh, is there a physical, do a physical and social assessment on this patient. Interview. Just like you interview for suspected child abuse, you do the same thing with elder abuse, but don't inter, uh, uh, don't interview them together. Now, older people in a room with the, uh, the potential abuser are not going to see anything because they got to live with these older people and they know it. Even if you get them apart, they might not say. Document, document, document. I used to say on the additional narrative, but now you got to do it on the e-meds. So, document. What did you see? What did you observe? What was the interaction between the, 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 the caretaker and the older person. Does the caretaker always answer? Does the older person look at the caretaker before they answer? What, nine times, listen, the survey was done a number of years ago by a, a doctor in Rochester. Um, he's, an, he's a geriatrician, but he has an interest in, in EMS. Uh, um, Manish, Manish Shaw, Shaw, EMS. He did a survey, uh, uh, and the elder abuse, the Center for Elder Abuse did a survey too a number of years ago, and they both came out with the same things. EMS providers, when they report elder abuse and neglect, 98% of the time they are correct. In, in the first survey, the other 2%, one died, one moved out of the study area so they couldn't. But 98% of the time we are correct with our suspicions. But document, 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 because when they go to court, 
we're going to go with them. Uh, look, at the, look at how they live. Is there hazardous conditions in the home? Are the utilities adequate working? If it's 30 degrees out, is it 30 degrees in? If it's 98 degrees out, is it 98 degrees in? Uh, apply the smell test. And you know, everybody knows what that is. When you hit the front door, what does it smell like? Look at the food supply. Are there drugs and alcohol? Is it sold bedding? If they need a walker, wheelchair, chair, or telephone, is it provided to them? If it's not and somebody is supposed to provide it, why isn't it being provided? Is there confinement and isolation? If it's a group living situation, like a, a ma and pa uh, uh, assisted living home, is there adequate care? And you all can define adequate care. There's no definition of that. Is it, but, but what I'll say is it's a, the care that they're getting there is something that you'd want your mother or father or grandmother or grandfather to have. When you assess them, look at their overall hygiene or clothing. Look, when you do the physical assessment, are there any forensic injury patterns that look familiar? Like my arm, I tried to get the photograph, I couldn't get it. Cigarette lighter burns, rope burns. I walked in a house one day, and a very nice house, and the guy had zip ties on the table. And we thought, he was a, we thought it was an abuse situation, and I said, oh, you remodel on the home? He said, no. But I told my mother, she doesn't comply, I'm going to tie her hands together. He got arrested. Little, subtle clues. So, oh, skin bruising, finger bruising, in the shape of something. Belt buckle, I've seen belt buckle. Uh, uh, bed sores, manifestations. I'm not, not talking about alopecia associated with aging. I'm talking about traumatic hair loss, clumps of hair being pulled out, burns, is there signs of blunt trauma? Is there old and untreated fractures? Uh, we talk about this, vaginal rectal bleeding. Uh, usually older women, one of two reasons, they, they've been sexually abused or they have um, cervical cancer. Does the patient need help with their ADL? Bathing, eating, dressing, transferring, toileting. If they do, who's supposed to help them? If they're not getting that help, why? Don't be afraid to, listen, I've had several complaints in my career where I have asked the right questions to the wrong people and they complain. But you know, at the end of the day, who should advocate for older people? We should. So I, complain all you want. It'll bear itself out. Questions that you should ask of older people when you get them alone. Are you afraid of anyone in the home? Has anyone ever hurt or beaten you? Has anyone ever, that goes to abuse, has anyone ever failed to help take care of you when you needed it? That question goes to neglect. If you get a positive response, document it in the email. Uh, you have to decide on whether or not you should interview the suspected abuser. You have to play that by ear. Most of the time, maybe we should leave it. That these guys need to do it. They're trained to do it. They know how to do it. They know the right questions to ask. They're probably not going to... The suspected abuser is probably not going to, you know, do anything to them. If you ask if you do decide to ask the abuser, it's got to directly relate to your assessment findings. How did so-and-so get these bruises? Can you tell me how they got these bruises? Not, did you put those bruises on him or her? No. How did they get those bruises? Well, they fall a lot. Okay. And, and leave it at that. And you have to decide if the, what you see clinically, does that match the story? I agree. You can ask certain questions that, <coughs> excuse me, you can ask certain questions about injuries. How did so-and-so get those injuries? I would leave it at that. I would let these guys do the, the main interviewing. Yep. Yep. Well, Jeff is right. The abuse and neglect has occurred. Our job is to have a critical eye on the index of suspicion and, and make the referral. Uh, and here we go. Full, full interviews of suspected abuse should be completed by law enforcement and or adult protective services, health care, license, age, or long-term care ombudsman. Uh, don't be accusatory. And remember, just because an older person, the care provider, may be found guilty of abuse or neglect doesn't mean they're automatically going to be removed from the older person. Oftentimes, they're reunited after counseling and they're put back in the same... But if you're going to do it, 
What happened to the patient today? Let them tell you. Very open-ended question that we would ask, not accusatory. What kind of care does the patient provide? What kind of care does the patient require? And can you tell me how they received their injuries? Open-ended questions, I would leave it at that. Because you'll know by those three answers whether or not... Uh, uh, we're not going to go over that. But here's the thing with, with uh, the take-home message. We're, EMS is part of a larger team. There's adult protective services, there's healthcare facilities, there's law enforcement, there's a long-term care ombudsman. Our job is not to prove that the abuse and neglect has occurred. Our job is to have a high index of suspicion. The National Center on Elder Abuse, it's elder, elderabusecenter.org, that's a bad, I should have used a different color. National Center on Elder Abuse, just Google, great resources for uh, healthcare professionals. How do we put all this together? The GEMS diamond that my wife came up with, GEMS. What do we know about geriatric patients? They present atypically, they deserve our respect. You do an environmental assessment every time you go to an older person's home. We just talked about a lot of that. Your medical assessment, remember those age-related changes. Social assessment, you've got to assess for their ADLs. Can they provide for themselves if the answer is no? If they have nobody to do it, we've got to make a referral. If they have somebody to do it and they're not doing it, then we have a problem with abuse and neglect. That's all I got. Remember, if you want to have, you know, uh, hold on one second. <laughs>